All right, we're here. We're alive. Sound is working. Cameras seem to be working. We're on Rumble. We're on time. Yeah. We are definitely on time. We're on Locals. We're on Rumble. We're on YouTube, I believe. Something's going to go wrong. Uh, of course. I can't hear Mark. Can you turn him up? Uh, Hunley, you're too loud. No, Hunley, you're <laughs> too low. Hunley, if you could just get a cable plugged into a thing of a Tech 9. Yes. I like when you respond to the people who are having problems and it's like, you know, 18 hours after the show and you're like the cable guy who's coming over to fix their cable. I mean, your patience, <laughs> the patience uh, of you. I give you have unbelievable window. patience. I don't know. Maybe that's why you, you do well in tech because uh, these people, I'm going, Hunley, I need subtitles. I can't, I'm deaf. I live in the mountain in, town, in Arkansas. I got to have captions, Hunley. I do my best, but... um. <laughs> I'm going to start out with the uh, first question from a, an email somebody wrote in. I'm like, you know what? Wait, is, are we doing the show already? Yeah, I think so, because oh. there's going to be a lot of questions. And <laughs> folks, it would be really, really super helpful if you actually say question, and then I know what it is. Oh, what do you have there? Is that I, a Well, I got this yesterday at a thrift store in town, a great model of a B-17 that nice. seems to be flying around the place. This incredible model. I mean, it's a scale model, but where's just, Curtis? He's in. <laughs> he's right in there. I oh, mean, okay. he's, that's him right there, Curtis <laughs> and me. Awesome. And then I found this incredible soft drink that I have to do a commercial for because I signed on uh, for three commercials, and uh, it's it's called Leninade from Moscow, <laughs> the last Soviet cola that I purchased in a thrift store and apparently the guy told me inside the bottle cap which i have yet to open is a slogan from lenin in oh. every diff a different slogan inside every bottle and there's like a like an artist conception of lenin drinking the uh lenin aid i love it i love right. it i just learned something the other day that i i didn't put together um that earth day is actually lenin's birthday yeah, 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 yeah. It was, well, a it was a deliberate thing. Yeah, yeah. I've heard that too. I, I mean, I always thought that was an urban myth, but I guess there's some truth to it. Here's the other weird one. Guess who else's birthday it was? Oppenheimer. You know, I saw the movie last night, and of course, it was everything I thought it would be. The best review I read was Brody from The New Yorker. Uh, you know, just said it's Wikipedia on film, and uh, he's not far off. Um, oh, oh, the History Channel. With the History budget. Channel was a headline, yeah, by Brody. Great review. Everybody else, 99.9% .9 of Rotten Tomatoes. It's garbled. It, it's muddled, just like I thought it would be. The sound was impenetrable. The dialogue with German accents, it's completely hard to understand. There's multiple Eastern European accents with multiple actors doing in and out of their accents. The sound mix is atrocious. Uh, the volume of the sound is unbearable. It's a mess. It's a mess. And uh, in fact, I, you know, as bad as it was, I think the first one, uh, Fat Man and Little Boy with Paul Newman in 1989 is a better film uh, with John Cusack. You know, it's funny. You're talking about the sound and it's a mess. It's a complete mess. I, it was I, driving I, me insane. I, I'm finding that more and more on on everything that mm -hmm. they're they're They used to have a requirement, I believe, where they had to punch up the the mid levels and so the voice always was riding over and you can hear mm -hmm. them but i'm constantly turning on subtitles anymore you know it's so funny in the uh coming attractions now they have subtitles for the hearing impaired and i'm going like god i wonder if they're going to have this for the actual movie and of course they didn't but they really needed subtitles for, uh, for the movie because there's so many different accents uh including murphy's the star who go goes in and out of this accent where he's trying to you know uh, be an American accent of Oppenheimer, who is really an upper middle, upper middle class Jew from Manhattan, who was raised with, you know, Renoir's and Picasso's in his house and everything. So he's got a weird accent to begin with, the real Oppenheimer. So Murphy's accent is, is all over the map and everything else. E everything that people said about it um, is a crock of shit. And, and the movie's muddled. It's, um, I, I don't know. You know, I, you know, I watch it. It's, it, it's, 
you know, it's a professional movie. It's it's over three hours long, if you need that. It goes into four or five acts of the structure. But read the Brody uh, re review from The New Yorker. That really sums it up. Cool. All right. So I'm going to open the first question from Stephen Haven, who um, emailed it in on my contact form. If people want to email messages from Mark, I make sure I forward them over. You may or may not, you know, hear anything. Probably won't. But ericunley.com slash contact. And his is just a general question. I think you've said it before, but where were you when JFK was killed? What were you doing in your life? <clears throat> PS194 in Brooklyn, playing punch ball in the schoolyard, which is a game um, from school. I mean, we play punch ball on the side, but uh, punch ball, you can either, there's no pitcher in punch ball. You take the ball, it's a baseball type game. You take the ball, Spalding or Pensy Pinky, and you punch the ball with a closed fist, either either overhand or sidearm on a field, like a stick ball kind of field. And a guy came, uh, there's people there, it was on, on a side street. And there's fencing, like for a softball field is where you're playing it on, a concrete softball field. A lot of New York softball is played on concrete, by the way. Um, you can slide on concrete. Let them, I've seen that done. But we were in, you know, whatever grade we were in, in third grade. And... Um, guy had a transistor radio said what he said the president's been shot and killed the teacher uh gathered us up and we were brought back into the school and sent home now, i lived across the street so i just walked down knapp street went into my parents into our apartment um, on the fourth floor and then we watched the news and you know all day and night until uh ruby killed oswald hmm. crazy all right um that's such a okay. Somebody is saying, how different would things be if they missed? If they missed Kennedy, I'm guessing. I mean, well, I mean, there's all kinds of different uh, uh, history revisionistic things that you can go through. I mean, I don't know. I mean, you could talk about the Vietnam War, um, but missed when? Missed in Tampa? Missed in Miami? Missed in right. Chicago? Missed, missed in at the Dallas? Ranch. Well, the ranch was the next day is where I was getting at. You know, the ticket sales were sluggish. <laughs> According to Ralph Yarborough, the senator from, from um, uh, Texas, the Democratic liberal senator, Ralph Yarborough, said that the ticket sales were sluggish because nobody was pushing the ticket sales because nobody on the inside thought there was going to be a barbecue at the LBJ ranch the next day. But I believe the train would have ended at that station at the LBJ ranch, uh, according to what I've heard. He was okay. not going to be able to leave that ranch. Yeah, and, and that makes sense. I mean, if it was that urgent, they probably would have kept trying. They they tried before. Yeah, I mean, look, they tr right. They tried in Chicago. They tried in Tampa. They tried in, in, in Miami. The, who knows where else they tried that we didn't know about. All right, uh, Trey Hemeter. I was at the Bell helicopter plant a few weeks ago. I asked where the Walter Dornberger conference room was, and all I got was a blank stare. I don't know if there is a conference room, but there is an award every year. And somebody asked uh, uh, the head of NASA why they give out the Dornberger Award to an ex-Nazi. And the guy was clueless about any of it. There's some award, some medal or something that NASA gives out. Um, I don't know what Bell does. That's a private company. But uh, NASA does something with... Um, Either Dornberger or Von Braun, one or the other, getting some sort of medal or an award. Interesting. Um, Ross Brand wants to know, why does RFK Jr. never mention LBJ? Democratic icon. That's why he never mentions Biden. Uh, they're the same guy, essentially. They're both uh, liberal Democratic icons. Um, if he went after LBJ now, it would just be un unbearable for him. He can barely go after Biden's son, he had no comment again the other day when confronted uh, about the indictments and situation with Hunter Biden. He had no comment. He said, I'd rather not get involved in any of that. We'd rather not get involved. And why run for president? You'd rather not get involved. I mean, if you're just going to cherry pick issues, you'd rather not get involved in. I mean, what's the point of running for the most powerful office in the world? I mean, you're asked a direct question. You have to have a response. You can't say, I'd rather not get involved. You know, I don't, I don't get it. You know, you, you're involved. I mean, this is you're complaining the guy's not giving you Secret Service protection because it's costing you two hundred thousand dollars a month to to pay uh, a sketchy guy named Gavin De Becker 
who was one of the sketchiest cats in LA uh, at the Pelicano level of sketchiness, but Gavin De Becker is the head of his security. I mean, where does Gavin De Becker end up? The head of the FBI? I mean, people should know this guy's name. That's who, that's who runs his security, Gavin De Becker, folks. Check him yeah. out. Gavin De Becker worked, on, uh, worked with Reagan. Way back uh, well, ch check out this guy. He is a uh, offbeat dude, to put it mildly. <laughs> All right. Um, let me see. I've got nothing. Hold on here on locals. Jim Pangus um, or Panagus. Question How did the Dallas PD slash FBI get away with changing the rifle found at the bookstore depository from being a German made Mauser to an Italian made? Carcano. Well, I, I mean, I get away with is 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 debatable. I mean, they, they pulled the the uh, Carcano out of the building. I mean, ask Walter Cronkite how he changed it from two consecutive nights saying a German Mauser was found in the Texas School Book Depository to an Italian made Carcano. Ask CBS News how and why they changed their broadcast. That would be much more effective than asking Dallas police who did the changing um as to the rifles how do they get a, a, a 303 british enfield on the roof and bring it down from the fire escape filmed by uh, local dallas news uh filmmakers uh, newsmen and then pull a 303 british enfield out of uh, wesley buell frazier's um closet and threaten him uh with the electric chair in huntsville um and if he didn't flip and do their bidding with after two uh, lie detector tests. I mean, so you've got multiple rifles that have questions. The Carcano, you've got the Mauser, and you've got the British Enfield on the roof. And, of course, the fourth rifle, which is uh, uh, Frazier's own rifle. But I, I think the two rifles are the same. The British Enfield on the roof and the British Enfield in Frazier's closet is one and the same. I think that um, Frazier was being set up as an accomplice, quote unquote, and a possible, a possible shooter on the roof himself, or possibly they planted a, uh, uh, his rifle on the roof, and, uh, and that was the rifle that they took down. And that they said that they got the same rifle out of his, out of his uh, closet. Uh, clearly, the pressure on Frazier was enormous. I mean, they, they said you're going to be charged with the murder of the president. Uh, no one realizes this. He was brought back twice by Dallas police. He was lie detected twice. Um, it, it was, you know, a, a Detective Rose who um, does the lie detecting work. And Rose will eventually be featured in the Thin Blue Line, the Errol Morris film uh, in the 80s for framing an innocent man having nothing to do with politics. Uh, simply as a framer of the Dallas Police Department, Rose was uh, one of the top guys. And, you know, they really put the pressure on Frazier to flip and then come up with a curtain rod story and his sister uh, went along with it, uh, Lenny Mae Randall. So I don't know, there's, a, there's four rifles and not to mention uh, Deputy Sheriff uh, Weatherford, who's up on the uh, uh, top of the, uh, the uh, courthouse, criminal records building with his sniper rifle that another deputy sheriff said he touched uh, on the way down and, and the barrel was hot. So there's that rifle, you know, from Weatherford. Hmm. If that helps anybody, I don't know. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, what does Mark know about John Martino? I don't know. Project I Freedom. I, I, I thought that that was dealing with a new movie. I was like, I don't know if this is relevant, but I see a John Martino on Spartacus. Uh, um, I don't know who he is. Cuban or something? Yes. Mm -hmm. Looks like he must be one, one of the Cubans. One of the Watergate Cubans? Um, I guess so. I guess so. 56. Mm -hmm. um, He's got a couple of aliases on besides John Martino, if I recall. He okay. was uh, with Frank Sturgis, whose real name is not Frank Sturgis. Frank Sturgis is a Cuban with a uh, Cuban name. Uh, so I think Martino and Sturgis might have been a team. Okay. Yeah. Well, I hadn't heard of um, that one. Um, this isn't really the same assassination folks but um there's a different channel they want here i think i, we, I, guess, I think we went over this last week yeah about well, yeah they had dinner yeah um, but th thank you very much for the super chat well i am going to try to stick to jfk because the, the uh, questions yeah. are going to pile up here um 
do you think the aerospace NASA group played a part in the plot? Okay, so there's this coffee place, Riley's Coffee Place. Uh, it's a, um, a place that sells bulk coffee, ground coffee in uh, New Orleans. And um, Oswald got a job there as a front uh, place. Guy was a, uh, the owner was a right-wing uh, operative uh, for uh, Deep State. And he employed various people as cover jobs there. And, um, and it seems like a lot of the people who worked at Riley's went on to have jobs at NASA. Um, I don't know what to make of it. Uh, Diogenio is aware of it and has written about it. Um, there seemed to be some deep state connection in New Orleans from the coffee place to NASA. Not that the coffee place had anything to do with NASA, but I mean, there seemed to be a, a front company there for people who were, who were going to be sent to NASA. And you've got uh, Von Braun and you've got uh, other elements of Nazis that were at NASA, you know. So I, I'm not really sure what the connection is other than, you know, people who were scurrilous who were at NASA. Okay. Um, Sylvhand on Local sent a tip asking a question. Why are Bannister and the New Orleans guys using Oswald's name as early as 1961 while Oswald is in the USSR? Wouldn't that be a bit early to start establishing him as a patsy compared to the Mexico thing in September 63? Well, I mean, you're talking about a guy whose name was in the paper to begin with for, before he's a patsy. He's on the front page of papers for having been a defector. So, I mean, his name is, you know, he, there are doubles of him running around. There's a double that's in Russia that's running around, and there's doubles in New Orleans that are running around. So they used his name to purchase these Jeeps, I believe, in um, Louisiana. And I, th I always believed that they believed he was going to come back and, and be involved in some other things because I think the people who were handling Oswald looked at Minsk as just another assignment. He wasn't going to stay there forever. He, he, he gathered the human intelligence and he came back and he came back to New Orleans. That's where, that's where his base of operation. So, you know, I mean, look, Oswald's mother, Marguerite writes a letter to Jay Hoover saying, why are they using my name, my son's name uh, here in New Orleans? I mean, she was aware of it. She knew that he was a, an, a, a, a double agent and, you know, whether Robert believed her and said his mother was a crackpot, uh, his mother wrote a letter to Jay Hoover saying they were using her son's name there in New Orleans. So maybe she wasn't that much of a crackpot. All right. Hmm. This is a bit of a humor one. Let's play F. Mary Kill. Ruth Payne, Dr. Mary Sherman, Marguerite Oswald. What does F. Mary Kill, Mary Kill mean? It, it's, a, it's a joke of a game. Uh, who oh. would you have sex with? Who would you marry? Who would you kill if you had to pick them three? It, it's... Kind of a silly question. Oh, uh, that's weird. I mean, Ruth Payne's in a nursing home now, from what I understand. Mary Sherman. Uh, I'm going to think at the time. Yeah, I'm going to think oh, it's, oh, it's 63. Oh. <laughs> well, Mary Sherman, I, I'm going to go with the doctor. I mean, uh, Mary Sherman, she had a she looked all right, and she had a good career and nice apartment. Hey, there you go. Um, question, can Mark elucidate on the burning down of courthouses and tax offices in relation to early LBJ politics. I don't know anything about this. They burned down courthouses in Texas. Um, I don't know, I never heard anything about that. In right. early LBJ politics, I, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not. not what does that help? That helps LBJ or? I, I don't know. I mean, it's, uh, uh, I'm lost. Um, great to see you both again. What are your thoughts on Rose Sheremy? Was she credible at all? I'd like to know what happened to her. Um, well, she died, I think, uh, of a heroin overdose. She was a junkie. I mean, uh, can, can junkies lie? I mean, usually when they move their lips. So, I, you know, I, I, again, you know, how much weight do you want to put into someone of that, uh, that world? Um, there are others who are more credible than Rose Charming, let me put it that way. All right, fair enough. Um, question, who do you think are the three best Democratic Party politicians of the post-World War II period? Uh, just general politicians? I guess. 
Um, you know, politicians. How about that? I, know, I mean, there was some... Moynihan was pretty good. Moynihan, yeah. I mean, he he was he served in a bunch of different posts. Um, Adlai Stevenson obviously ends up as the ambassador to the UN dealing with the Cuban Missile Crisis and ran for president a number of times, Stevenson. Um, Mo Udall was pretty good. Best Democratic Party politicians in the post-World War II period. What's out west? Is there anything out west? Mo, or... Mo Udall, I think, is a, is a good one. He was the uh, congressman who famously said, um, what is it, um, we want to uh, make sure we have people who piss out of the tent rather than in the tent. And... Oh, a caucus is like a cactus, except the pricks are on the inside. That's a good line. <laughs> he definitely at least had good lines. That's a good line. Um, let me see. Uh, wow, thank you very much, PR and Jay Grudge. Very generous. What happened to the air? It was flown back to uh, Dallas. I mean, to, from Dallas to, to Washington. I'm sorry. Okay, could it have taken off with the... President's body ahead of Air Force Two during the swearing-in ceremony. Huh? What happened to Air Force Two plane? Could it have taken off with the president's body ahead of itself? I, I, I don't. I don't think, think you mean, worded it the way you wanted. I think you want. I think it means Air Force One there during Maybe. the swearing-in ceremony. Uh, no, <laughs> because I mean they, they schlepped that casket up the stairs. And the handle broke. They had to unscrew the seats in the back. I mean, uh, the, the general guarded it uh, nonstop. Um, the, the Kenny O'Donnell and Powers and Jackie were all back there with a the casket in the back of Air Force One. Um, in fact, they they wanted LBJ to take Air Force Two and leave uh, um, immediately, and they believed um, that he was on Air Force Two. Uh, the general um, who was um, guarding the the casket thought he had left on Air Force Two, as did other people, as did Powers, as did uh, Kenny O'Donnell. And uh, he wanted to be sworn in in that plane with Jackie uh, in Air Force One uh, with that casket in the back. And in fact, they transferred his luggage uh, to Air Force One from Air Force Two. That was holding up the plane as well. And it was 111 degrees inside the plane because they couldn't have air conditioning they didn't turn the engines on so it was super hot in there and they were just saying let's get the hell out of here wow brutal um on locals fair lane stand one question mark do you think robert vinson's cia flight as told in the book flight to dallas is credible i don't know the book i, don't, I never heard the name okay Somebody's asking, uh, Katie Sue, Texas on Locals, what do we have planned for the 60th? At this point, we don't have any plans for the 60th anniversary. The conference we went to last year is in Pittsburgh. There's no need for us to go to Pittsburgh for a JFK concert uh, conference. And the other conference that's there is, um, what, what would you say, spook adjacent? Or how, how do you put The that? spook conference. It's a conference of spooks. But, but if anybody wants to watch Judy um, Judith Barry Baker, she will be at the conference that is in uh, in Dallas in November and others. So let me see. Um, Mark Lane said there was a CIA document stating that Carcano was not the murder weapon. If this is true, isn't that kind of huge? I'd like to see the document before I comment on a document that I haven't seen, but... Um... The, the the gun, I'll tell you this much, the gun that's in the Smithsonian is not the, the gun. It's, it's a different weapon entirely, and that's been proven uh, fairly emphatically on uh, Wikipedia and other sources. The, um, the weapon that's in the Smithsonian is not the supposed murder weapon. It's a different model of a Carcano, different le length of the barrel. It's got the side swivels on it, um, so that's kind of interesting. All right. A um, couple of tips just came in on this. Uh, Vorleaser said, Mark and Eric, thanks for all your great work. We need to shine the light on the darkness of Big Brother. See you in Montgomery. Awesome. Okay. And James Vespa sent a very generous $50 tip. Keep the info flowing. And Victory Fours asking, curious what happened to the 
post of the men who killed Kennedy has stopped loading. I didn't get to the last episode. Thanks for all the other content. I'll have to look at that. Wait, from us or from the on locals? Um, oh, oh, that I don't know. The episode nine was banned in the United States. So. Right, but but I th somehow they found their way on our locals. What? Yeah. Well, we try to share things. So. Well, the men who killed Kennedy. The last one's about the last episode's about LBJ, and mm -hmm. um, it aired once and before they went ballistic, and that's a good phrase. Went ballistic. The. Uh, <laughs> And the, the forces of LBJ forced um, the History Channel to uh, take it down. Which and they even had that that whole intro on it. Yeah, the, right. The, 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 host, the host came out and said, uh, uh, "This is mere speculation or something, some kind of mumbo jumbo." All right, Chris, what do you know about the painted curbs, yellow stripes, or um, yeah. yellow stripes on the curbs, yeah. visible in the frames? Yeah, no, it's it's quite interesting. It's uh, came to me late in life. The uh, there they were seemed to be some markers of where to, when to shoot um, when the limo got within that uh, those parameters of the yellow markers on the curb. I mean, it's astounding. I mean, I don't know um, if anybody saw them painting it. Uh, I know some people were painting it, city workers, but I mean, uh, I, they were there for quite a while the yellow markers on the curb and they that's interesting mm, what's that oh now i'm back i didn't see myself so I oh you were fine <laughs> that, that's so weird man it's so weird well it, uh, it, yeah i don't know the, the, the curb yellow marker thing is is new to me but fascinating and back then they would do things like that for drops and different espionage yeah. too. Yeah, right? yeah, like yeah. Just a marker, a mark on the tree would say that the drop's going to be yeah. over there. So, well, somebody know. did some mathematics though on these because it's um, designed to hit a mark by the mm -hmm. limo of when to shoot. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm quite sure. Once it crosses that point, then you fire or whatever. Um, Harold, my dad arrived in England. Barry St. Edmunds, Suffolk, um, O145 flew. B-17Gs, barely 20 years old, first bombing run over the keel subpins. Okay. Awesome. Wow. Um, Ray Nitsupak. Uh, I don't know how to say that. Ray Nitsupak. Question. Tippet involved up to his neck or just a poor dumb cop? I think it's somewhere in the middle. You know, I think he... Uh, I, 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 no one's ever going to be able to figure out the enigma of Tippet, but um, if you place him in the carousel club and you place him close in proximity to the world of um of crawford and of ruby and uh, they shoot him uh you can look at it that he is involved in some level that we're not really aware of i mean there, there are parts to this thing that we're never going to be able to figure out the fact of the matter is though that oswald didn't shoot him and he was immediately blamed for shooting him so you know, he's got a lot of patsy on him, Tippett. I got to tell you, I mean, it's um, it's a guy, I think, who is involved and a patsy, uh, not unlike, you know, some other people on this thing. I think there was some minor involvement or some major involvement, possibly with Tippett, on the street level. And I think that uh, they wanted to frame Oswald for killing the cop. And I think that uh, Ruby and Crawford, were involved. I mean, Crawford fled the next day. And like I said, the Warren Commission asked him why he would flee uh, from the assassination of the president. Uh, what's it to you? They said, why do you care? You know what I mean? Like, why would you? He was saying that I didn't, I didn't want to be blamed for this. And when the Warren Commission drilled down further in the Larry Crawford testimony, they said, well, why would you be blamed for the assassination of the president? And he realized he, he, he effed up. And he said, well, I got nervous, you know, I didn't want to be around, you know. But if you equate the killing of the president to the killing of Tippett, uh, now you've got a reason for him to flee the next day like a bat out of hell to go up to the Canadian border and be dragged back by the FBI uh, literally a few days later when they track him down. I mean, he Crawford was up to something, and I believe he was involved in the murder of uh, J.D. Tippett. Yeah, and you found the uh, the jacket. Um, oh, parallel. right, the jacket. Yeah, the jacket too. And 
Everybody check out that episode. We do mm -hmm. have an episode on Larry Crawford. I mean, it's spelled weird, C-R-A-F-A-R-D. But He crazy. spelled it multiple ways, and um, I think Eric's using the Warren Commission uh, spelling. Right. Um, AJ Parks wanted to know, the developer of the trademark, Trammell Crow, was a big name in Dallas. Can I strike him off my list of Dallas dodgy guys, or is yeah, there more to him? No, I think so. I think the real battle um, is the Connolly battle against um, uh, the White House to get the final speech of JFK at the Trade Mart as opposed to the Women's Building at the fairgrounds. And uh, everybody wanted to go to the fairgrounds, including the Secret Service. Everybody wanted to go to the Women's Building except one man, and that's John Connolly, who insisted on going to the Trade Mart, which makes the parade route uh, go in the direction it does. And uh, they didn't have to go down that far down Main Street to Stemmons Freeway. They could have gone across town. Um, but the reality of it is, the as the Secret Service said about the trademark, it was completely unprotectable. It had multiple catwalks, all kinds of entrances and exits. And uh, maybe if they didn't get them in Dealey Plaza, the next stop on the freight train might have been the trademark because... Um, you know, it's even copied in the parallax view with Warren Beatty. If you want to see a uh, political assassination in a building that's a copy of the trademark, look at the parallax view with Warren Beatty. That's a pretty good movie. I oh, yeah. So oh, yeah. Great film. It holds Great up. Film. A, lot, a lot better than Oppenheimer. <laughs> right. Um, Silfhand sent in a tip saying, do you think Oswald really was at a planning session to kill JFK in New Orleans? If so, does it mean he was infiltrating it or that he was involved, even if he was not the assassin and later became the patsy? Uh, well, he's infiltrating a lot of stuff. I mean, I wouldn't put it past him to be in, in, in that session that's depicted in the film uh, with David Ferry and Clay Shaw. I mean, that's the, that's the entire case of the, uh, of the Shaw case was that... Um, Oswald was there, according to the the, uh, the taxi cab driver Russo, um, later became a taxi cab driver. Um, he says that Oswald was there, so I, I don't know. You know, Russo uh, was given sodium pentothal to see if he was lying. He was lie detected by Garrison multiple times to see if he was lying. Uh, Russo seems to be quite a credible witness uh, that Oswald was there. Whether it was a planning session or a bull session or a party or whatever, uh, there was stuff that was discussed at, at uh, that ferry apartment uh, that night. All right. Let's see, back to here. A clincher for me was that the CIA and our military used similar teams to kill foreign leaders in the 50s and 60s. They just turned a team around against their own leader. Can you list the foreign leaders killed? Can I list them? There's quite too many for me to list them, that's for sure. I think uh, RFK said there was about 82 or something uh, that governments that were toppled um, by the CIA. Uh, this is from RFK Jr. I think there was 82 uh, various governments since 1949 that the CIA has overthrown. Uh, as for the assassination of, of leaders, uh, Lumumba, obviously one of them, um, Dag Hammarskjöld, um, the DM brothers out of uh, South Vietnam, um, obviously, uh, or Ben's in Guatemala in 1953 is off the top of my head. Uh, there's many others. All right. Um, do you think after the 60th anniversary in Dealey Plaza and if renovations are done, will people lose interest in JFK? And do you intend to continue your research? Love you guys. And no, I, I'm going to continue. I haven't stopped. This, the 50th didn't matter. The 40th. I mean, what it doesn't really matter to me. It just keeps going on and on and on. You know, um, when someone gets into power who can release these documents down below the, the bottom of the documents, we may get something, you know, that they're hiding down there in the documents. I think, I don't know, look, is it going to be a smoking gun? Probably not. But like I said, I think there's going to be more, more about Mexico City. Um, that's kind of my hunch that, um, they're protecting at this point, foreign sources that they, um, the, the foreign sources want protection and they're using their connections with the United States to not out 
various people in other countries involved in the assassination. And you say involved. Well, I, you know, what I mean is um, sources that we used in Mexico City um, to help us um, in the, the framing of Oswald, for instance, in Mexico City, the, the torture of um, the woman who worked in the embassy, worked in the uh, um, uh, embassy in Mexico City, uh, Sylvia Duran, uh, we brought in, um, we brought in at our request, um, Mexican intelligence to torture her, to say that she, A, slept with Oswald, B, saw Oswald on two occasions in the Cuban embassy uh, in Mexico City. Um, she was a Mexican national who was, uh, had communist leanings, not unusual for Mexico, but nevertheless, I believe there's stuff in there. This is just my hunch about Mexico City. And uh, that's what I've always believed. And um, the, the, the Achilles heel of the assassination is Mexico City um, because you have these phony sightings, phony photos, phony phone calls. And all before the assassination occurs, they are being sent to uh, J. Edgar Hoover, who sniffs it out and tells LBJ that this guy at the embassy is an imposter. And the calls are phony. I mean, you can't explain it. You can't explain it. I mean, they're framing Oswald by September 28th in Mexico City. And um, the assassination doesn't happen for two months later. So you can't have it both ways, people. You know, either he, either he did it in the spur of the moment as a lone nut assassin, or um, they were trying to frame him down in Mexico City in September. Uh, with a you know phony phone calls, phony guy going in trying to get what I'm alluding to is the visa, uh, the escape visa that he was trying to get. What they wanted to do was frame Castro for the assassination. There were um, elements in the United States uh, intelligence um, that were not happy with the Bay of Pigs, not happy with the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, this would have been a third year in a row of crazy crap involving. Uh, Cuba. This would have been the third year, Eric. I mean, if you think about the Bay of Pigs, then the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, if this had continued, it would have called for the overthrow or the full-scale invasion of Castro if they had fingered Castro as the guy that brought in Oswald to kill the president, which I believe um, elements of the uh, intelligence were trying to do out of Mexico City. And, uh, you know, I know there's a lot of documentation of that. Yeah, um, <clears throat> this one's been asked before for sure, but um, Jay Cutberth on Locals. Mark, tell us why you don't believe the Zapruder film was altered by the fence or why it's a double Because I just believe Robert Groden. That's why I, I go with Groden's analysis. He's a film expert. He's the guy that brought the film onto TV. He handled the film during the uh, the uh, Garrison Clay Shaw case. He was the one who got it from Time Life after it had been in the vault. He's had the uh, uh, the film in his possession. He made copies of it during the Clay Shaw trial. He's the one that brought it to Geraldo tonight in 1977. Uh, and he says that that is a pristine copy of the film. You want to argue with Robert Groden, knock yourself out. I don't want to do it. I believe Robert Groden, and that's my answer. I believe the CIA, and I'll say this again for the 900th time, wants to reduce the validity of the only evidence of a presidential assassination on film. The thing that is, has fingered them and bothered them and uh, is the thorn in their side is the Zapruder film. Any way that they can diminish the validity of the Zapruder film is beneficial for them. I am not a friend of theirs. I believe that the original film is valid and every attempt in the past six to eight years, this is another attempt to devalue the Zapruder film recently by the CIA using a CIA operative named Dino uh, something or other who sat down with Doug Horn and uh, bamboozled him into believing the film was altered. Doug Horn was duped. He's not, uh, a prosecutor. He's not a cop. He's not an investigator. He's a nice guy who put out the AARB five volume set and uh, maybe he needed the money. Maybe he was duped. I don't know. But when I see filmed interviews with CIA operatives trying to tell me the history of the Kennedy assassination, I become a little skeptical. 
and that's where this is right now. It's that this guy, Dino uh, Brugiani, or whatever his name is, is the guy who is driving the crazy train uh, for the benefit of the CIA, by the way. Any damage they can do to the legacy of the Zapruder film helps the CIA. I recall he identified himself as a CIA officer, mm -hmm. so it, it's wide out there. It's yeah. not like it. Yeah. Not like we're accusing him of. He no, said, no, I'm CIA. Right. I'm going to interview a CIA agent who's going to help me solve the Kennedy assassination after 50 years. I mean, just think how preposterous that sounds, people. But Doug Horn, bro. But he's Doug Horn. Okay. So what? What does that mean? All right. Fair enough. Um, A.L. Parks saying, question, I've been watching various videos of LBJ at the funerals of JFK and Harold Holt, trying to determine if he showed any strange tics in his body language. Would you call him a great actor in any situation? I think he's a great Texas poker player. That's what I think he is. I, I knows how to play Texas Hold'em uh, politically, and I uh, think he's, you know, a guy who's a megalomaniac who's a sociopath. So, Sociopaths, you know, if you take Ted Bundy, I mean, the guy was able to blend in and possibly run for the Senate. There were people who wanted to groom Ted Bundy to become a United States senator. I mean, uh, Bundy looked and acted normal. He was able to defend himself in, in a couple of his cases. Um, oh, he was outstanding. The judge, it was a, the weirdest thing in the world. Before the judge sentenced him, mm -hmm. complimented him yeah, oh, yeah. for being a, an amazing yeah. representative and... It was like, it's such a shame that you had to turn out this way. You had to go down that road. Uh, it was, like, there was another road for die. you, Ted. You know. <laughs> I mean, it, it's bizarre, but yeah, the judge. But, I mean, I mentioned, like I mentioned Ted Bundy, and I'm, I'm not even joking that much. You know, in comparison to LBJ, he just had a different method of doing the same thing that Ted Bundy did. Yeah, yeah, it's very wild. But yeah, there's some looks. On LBJ, I mean, the wink, obviously, you know, from uh, uh, Albert uh, to uh, on Air Force One, the famous wink by the congressman. Um, you can't see LBJ's head is turned, but he's the recipient of the wink, you know, which is kind of odd with a dead body in the back and you're being sworn in president with a widow sitting, standing next to you with blood all over her. I mean, yeah. winking, you know, kind of winking is kind of weird. It's it's a little un, uh, uncustomary. Um, Boy on Rumble sent a rant in. I believe LBJ was offered the opportunity to get rid of JFK and accepted the deal. Is Could it be. reason is it reasonable to say that the office of the presidency was given as a payment? Except they had to have the confidence that he wouldn't turn on them. They couldn't just depend on him accepting the assassination of the president. They had to have the confidence that he was not going to go after them and track them down as Robert Kennedy would have if he had the power as the president. And um, remember, Robert Kennedy famously says in March of 68 that if, re -elect, if elected president, he was going to reopen the Warren Commission. He said that in, in L.A. And uh, he was dead within within two months um, of saying that. You know, Now, LBJ also said he was going to do everything he could to cut RFK's throat from ear to ear. He said that on numerous occasions and eventually... He had like 40 FBI agents tailing him in 1964 uh, with the help of his best friend, Jake Hoover. But, um, you know, the, the reality of it is um, LBJ was involved in the cover up. And the statement that this question offers is the belief of Oliver Stone that he's involved in the cover up on a massive level. But just luckily ends up as the accidental president, as many people in the press called him the accidental president. That was the nickname of LBJ. Um, I believe that they couldn't depend on a guy uh, without him knowing it coming after them. And that would be a, a real vulnerable position to be put in uh, without LBJ knowing it. And of course, he signs National Security Action Memo 273 within 48 hours, creating the Vietnam War, reversing Kennedy's uh, National Security Action Memo 263, with the body still in the rotunda of the Capitol, for Christ's sakes. I mean, all of this stuff could have waited. I mean, really? I mean, it, it was an invasion happening in Vietnam? I mean, there's, you know, five to 10,000 advisors there, and we had to have the war by the end of the week. You know what I mean? It, it seems like there was a quid pro quo that was signed off on so quickly 
by LBJ. And in, and in the movie, you know, they, he says, you want your war, I'll give you your goddamn war. Here it is. Uh, I don't, there's obviously no recording of that. I mean, it's Oliver's uh, uh, information coming via Fletcher Prouty and some others. But the reality is he had to be in on it. It happened on his watch in his state. He controlled every single apparatus in the state. Uh, the last stop on the train was his house. You know, all of this stuff in terms of Dallas, and, and, and this is not to deny there weren't other plots involved, like we discussed in Chicago and also in, in, in Tampa and Miami. There were. But this stop on the train in Dallas allowed him to control all the mechanisms of power there. I mean, he's on the phone, you know, to get into the cover up. He's on the phone talking to to Captain Fritz. Uh, you've got your man. LBJ is calling the doctor, uh, 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 Charles Crenshaw, in the in the uh, emergency room at Parkland saying, I'm bringing in a guy with a gun who's in there now who's going to take a deathbed confession from Oswald. Uh, this is a guy doing this himself, personally. It's a little weird. It's a little weird, Eric. I agree. Uh, escaped hams hamster on Rumble wants to know what became of the multi-billion dollar gold discovery in Victoria Park, New Mexico, that both LBJ and Nixon allegedly tried to get their hands on. Never heard anything about it. Some of these are... I don't know anything about it. All right, um, Dr. Joey Lodes, amazing work, guys. Thank you, thank you. Pamela Clifton, good afternoon, guys. Question, do you think Malcolm Wallace was on the sixth floor during the same, doing some shooting at the behest of LBJ? Well, he was on the sixth floor. I mean, that's irrefutable. The fingerprints are there on the boxes. Um, that's debatable whether he was shooting. I, I believe that someone was either on the end of the rooftop or the end of the sixth floor out of that uh, last window shooting down into the back of Governor Connolly. Whether that was the rooftop where they found the British Enfield or the sixth floor window at the end, which nobody saw open. So I believe it was on the rooftop probably. And, and it could have been Wallace. I mean, Wallace was a crack shot. Uh, somebody shot Connolly straight down from that rooftop in his back, went came out his chest, went through his wrist and down into his thigh. The angle of Connolly's wounds are straight down, my friends, straight down from the upper back to the lower chest, to the wrist, to the left thigh, almost a vertical line. It's not coming from the Dow Tex building, and it can't come from the Texas School Book Depository phony sniper's nest either. Um, it couldn't come from Weatherford. It has to come literally in my, when I was there with Eric, I mean, you could really see the angle of Connolly's shot. And if Connolly is shot from the rooftop, two things. One is a conspiracy, and two, there's another shooter in another location. So and, and that, that could be Malcolm Wallace, but I, I, I think it's either Frazier or Wallace. You know, Frazier um, eats lunch in the basement and the power goes out, you know, moments before the uh, assassination uh, of JFK. So the power is turned off in the building momentarily uh, and the power source was down in the basement. Why he says he's eating lunch in the basement is anybody's guess. He's never eaten lunch in the basement before. Nobody eats lunch in the basement. He says he's gone down alone to eat lunch in the basement. Okay, well, that's odd. It doesn't make any sense. Um, was he on the rooftop claiming to have been in the basement? I don't know. I don't know. And also keep in mind, Malcolm Wallace is in fact a, or was in fact a convicted murderer. Yes. No question. <laughs> yes, he, he would be number <laughs> one suspect. I, I I would go and look at Malcolm Wallace and say, where were you all day today? Because um, he's a Your convicted felon. Your fingerprint is here and he's been, yeah. he's done it. So. I mean, the, the fingerprints on the box, I mean, they're, they're, they're irrefutable. I mean, you brought in experts. They brought in experts to look at it. I mean, Joan Mellon, uh, apparently an LBJ protege, uh, being interviewed now has uh, claimed that Malcolm Wallace uh, fingerprints were not Malcolm Wallace. And how does she know? Because she asked a friend from the FBI to uh, look at the fingerprints and, and discredit them. So if you believe Joan Mellon and her FBI friends, then the fingerprints on the box are not Malcolm Wallace. But if you believe the um, authorities that were brought in to examine the fingerprints, the veteran uh, fingerprint analysis guy, uh, it is Malcolm Wallace's fingerprints. 
Ah, interesting. I, I saw a channel got shared with me that popped up recently, and I, I noticed that they started uploading videos about three months ago. I sent it to you, Mark, and I believe it was Joan Mellon, like a long oh, really? interview with her that was, oh, wow. uh, you know, in, in parts that um, started it out. So, okay, interesting. Carol yeah, I'm not alone. I mean, she wrote a good book on Garrison, and she wrote a good book um about haiti with de uh but all of a sudden she was getting money from the lbj library i believe to write this latest book according to uh sources that i trust all right harold wants to know wasn't there actually two yarborough texas rep senators uh one who was extremely corrupt and all i know is ralph yarborough the senator from texas uh, who was a liberal icon in the state of Texas and uh, uh, an incredible enemy of LBJ and John Connolly. He considered them both to be corrupt politicians. And the R Yarborough that's in the car with LBJ is the Yarborough <laughs> that um, uh, LBJ wanted sitting in the Connolly seat for reasons that uh, history will show um, he might have been correct from LBJ's point of view as to who should be sitting there. And he has the massive fight in uh, in Fort Worth, the uh, actually the morning of the assassination, because it was pretty late at night, with JFK about the seating arrangement uh, with Connolly still in the limousine. Um, as Jackie said, it was the loudest fight she ever heard her husband have with anybody. And uh, he insisted that Connolly sit with him because it was just from political point of view having a conservative democrat in the limo with him which is political makes political sense uh kennedy gained nothing from having another liberal senator sitting in front of him and ralph yarborough and ralph yarborough did not want to be sitting with lbj in that car in back of the motorcade he wanted to be with the president obviously i mean of course i mean any senator would but uh, Connolly and lbj did not want that seating arrangement we now know that to be true. All right. Uh, WC was complicit in, according to Sean David Morton, saying they forced Kennedy to take LBJ as a VP. He sat at the right hand of Satan. Who's WC? I don't know. I thought it was Warren Commission, but then that that would be after the fact. So Sean, Who's David, Sean Morton. David Morton. I don't know who that is either. But uh, just to address this thing about the thing. They, uh, the two FBI agents uh, showed up at the uh, hotel in Los Angeles in 1960 after he got the nomination. They showed him photos, compromised photos of women he had been with. Uh, J. Edgar Hoover wanted LBJ as vice president. J. Edgar Hoover pre pressured uh, John Kennedy into agreeing to it. Kennedy, John Kennedy made the deal with the LBJ people. And then when Robert found out about it, he went ballistic. And he came downstairs, they were in the same hotel a couple of floors down repeatedly, demanding that um, LBJ rescind the acceptance of the vice presidential slot. And, uh, and LBJ famously said, oh, come on, Bobby. And uh, the rest was history. And Bobby went back upstairs yelling at his brother, not knowing that the FBI had visited him the night before with photos of uh, JFK with various women in compromised positions. And he explained to Bobby, who knew about this anyway, uh, he explained to him that he was visited by these two FBI agents in the hotel in Los Angeles. And that really is the history of the acceptance of LBJ. And the famously, you know, the famous story is LBJ saying, you know, to find me the record of uh, uh, vice presidents, how many times they succeeded to the presidency, and it was once every 20 years, and he goes, I like them odds, I'm a gambler man, that famous line, which he told to uh, uh, Henry, Bo Henry, Bo Henry Luce's wife, uh, Claire Booth Luce, he told her that uh, during the inauguration of uh, JFK and limousine, and uh, he told also the aides who went and found the information about the 20 year um, uh, situation that, you know, every 20 years, the guy becomes a president in American history. So uh, he said, I like those odds, I'll take them. And he believed that he would be, you know, like a, 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 a co-president. He really believed that. And he began to write up uh, memos as soon as he became vice president, because they said to him, 
his own friends said, why would you give up the position as the most powerful man in Washington to become, you know, basically in a position that's as worthwhile as a warm bucket of spit, uh, to quote another vice president. And um, who also became president, by the way. Yeah, he, he Coincidentally. thought that he would be <laughs> co-president and he started to recommend friends of his for Supreme Court positions. I mean, really egregious stuff. And the Kennedys were just aghast, you know, that he was coming up with these these uh, uh, different positions and white papers and, and recommendations. And eventually they had to put him out to pastor, pastor by sending him overseas to these uh, ribbon cutting things just to get him out of Washington because um, they didn't want to have him around. Evelyn Lincoln kept finding him in the morning, uh, hovering over JFK's desk, looking at his papers coming in through the uh, back doors of the uh, 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 through the Rose Garden and she would come in and find him like at 8.30 or 8 o'clock in the morning before JFK got there looking at stuff in his desk. I mean, really weird stuff and you know, Bobby Kennedy said to her, how how often does he do this? And she says, I catch him all the time doing this. So, I, you know, look, I mean, he uh, uh, obviously succeeded him whether he was involved in a plot or not. Um, he took the job and he ended up becoming president of the United States. Now, keep in mind, there is also the drip, drip, drip of Robert Kennedy feeding Life magazine and Time magazine all the information about the Bobby Baker scandal and LBJ's involvement in the Bobby Baker scandal, LBJ's involvement in the in the uh, general dynamics, TFX, um, defense money, bribery scandals. He's faced with numerous scandals uh, where he believed and, 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 and Nixon believed and Robert Kennedy believed that he was going to prison. And um, in fact, Life magazine was planning a multi two part magazine expose of LBJ the, the, the day of the assassination. They had to pull the plug on the printer to print a new issue of Life magazine about the assassination and the issue they were printing was about LBJ and, and the scandal of Bobby Baker and LBJ's complicity in this and the fact that he was probably going to A, be dropped from the ticket and B, go to jail. So, I mean, he had a ticking clock to pull this off. You could say it's all a coincidence, you know, but there's just too many dots there. There's too much information. There's too many things to, to, to finger uh, LBJ's involvement in this thing and his necessity to, to become president. There was no way out. I mean, if he's dropped from the ticket a week later, just drop from the ticket. This is we're going to go in another direction. He's wide open to be indicted uh, in these in these scandals and go to jail. And and ask ask Billy Saul Estes if he went to jail. Ask you know ask uh, uh, these guys around him who went to jail. You know, when he becomes president of the United States, uh, all the investigations go away, Eric, overnight. All right. I got the quote wrong, by the way, is John Nance Garner, um, right. FDR's vice president. So yeah, mm, my mistake. But Truman becomes president. And um, Truman's depicted mm. in Oppenheimer, interestingly enough, about 16 hours into the movie. The uh, Truman shows up and gives him his hanky and says, uh, don't let that whining guy back in here ever again. The crybaby. You know, he's worried about the use of the atomic bomb and he wants to um, influence Truman to not... It not move forward with the hydrogen bomb program, which of course uh, would have led to Truman's impeachment if he did not. I mean, that would have just been insane uh, at the height of the Cold War. But Oppenheimer, which is riddled with guilt at that point, and goes to see Truman, um, and it doesn't end well for Oppenheimer. All right. Uh, Pasha's got a question. Mark, what is the strangest? Farthest in left field coincidence slash connection dot of the JFK assassination in your mind. Something to do with flying saucers. I, I mean, there's something with flying saucers and the Kennedy assassination. There's a book I have um, uh, that's pretty far out there and uh, that aliens killed JFK. In other words, Eric. That is pretty far out there. Yeah. All right, we kind of answered this um, earlier, but you know, I want to at least bring it up. Not glorifying Kennedy, however, can you hypothesize a bit of what the U.S. and the world would have looked like if he was not murdered and his peace vision allowed to develop? 
don't know. Well, let me put it this way. Um, they said they got lucky during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, we could not have a planet right now, possibly, if he continued as president. It could have gone really bad. He could have been duped by the Russians again into a um, disarmament of uh, one-sided dis uh, unilateral disarmament of our nuclear weapons. And the Russians could have uh, taken advantage of that, the Soviets. And uh, that could have led to a nuclear war right there. Uh, so we don't know. It's not always a bed of roses that you do these revisionistic histories. It could have ended quite badly if he succeeded on as president. We also answered this. Um, market by some chance, JFK escaped Dealey Plaza. Do you believe there are additional assassins already in place in other locations? Yeah. I mean, there, multiple sources have indicated that um, he was not going to leave the LBJ ranch alive, that there were three to six shooters from, I've heard different stories in the woods. And um, LBJ was always taking people around those woods. He, obviously, the LBJ ranch is huge. So it could have happened anywhere. Uh, but he does take people on these hunting trips in his uh, convertible Lincoln and his uh, Pearl Beer and his uh, Scotch uh, drunk driving, riding through the woods episodes. This is separate from the um, the amphibious car where he drives into his lake with people uh, claiming it to be an accident to see who jumps overboard to save themselves, <laughs> as opposed to the president. Um, he, he did that repeatedly with the amphibian uh, car, which floats and turns into a boat, and uh, then would say, look at him trying to save his own ass while his president's going down in a car. Isn't that, isn't that great? That was uh, <laughs> LBJ driving into the lake all the time, uh, drunk. Oh, boy. Um, South Jersey 76. Any credibility to Peter Janney's claim on Mary's Mosaic that the CIA was involved with the murder of Mary Pincho uh, Meyer uh, due to what she knew about the Kennedy assassination? Well, she knew a lot about it because she was his mistress. She did acid with him or, or smoke weed, one or both or the other. But Janney's completely suspect because his father was a huge CIA station chief. And Janney then becomes suspect. I'm sorry, people. I know you love the book. I know you're, it's one of your favorites. However, it's hard for me to accept the veracity of a CIA family member. And again, I, I, whether you appreciate that or not, it's hard for me to accept Peter Jenny uh, because of his father's background in the CIA and, and the family connections that we've shown in other episodes. And by the way, we're not saying Tucker Carlson's off the hook either. We know no, he's related. No, no, okay. that's right. That's right. <clears throat> so... Before anybody starts commenting on that, yeah, no, it's 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 bipartisan, my friends. <laughs> it's uh, look at the Dick Carlson episode, and you'll see what we mean. You know, all right, hey guys, it's my son-in-law's birthday. Can you shout out a happy birthday to Nick Care? Nick Care, Care. You, you are one of the greatest kids that you are. So lucky, Nick Care. I got to tell you something. To have this father watch this channel and make you watch it tomorrow to see this, it's one of the greatest birthdays you're ever going to have. Perfect. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> Lynn Blechstein. I watched Box of Broken Dreams. My best friend followed her dreams in Hollywood. Killed her after 15 years. Cried hard. I missed her 12 years later. Yeah, there's quite a few, Lynn. I mean, uh, uh, he was not alone, the, the one that I covered in that story. There's many, many more that I know about and that other people know about. Uh, it's dark, bro. It's dark. But, you know, people come. There's a person in every town who comes to Hollywood. There's a the person in every small town. Everybody knows who that person is. Could be the offbeat cheerleader. It could be the handsome guy who is the drunken quarterback who thinks he could be the next Jack Nicholson. There's somebody in every small town, and everyone knows that. And that's the guy that leaves the town and comes to L.A., ends up, you know, being a waiter, going on some auditions. Maybe he gets a couple of background parts. Maybe he gets a, a role in something, and then it goes south. And then the darkness descends, you know. Wow. All right. Um, Chase wants to know, Mark, what are your thoughts on the 2016 film Jackie and its depiction of the assassination? I, I've, I've seen it. I, I, I forget what the depiction is. I forget what the film is. Yeah, I've seen the film, but I don't remember specifically what, how it's depicted. 
All right, did anyone ever try to find out who Tippett was trying to contact when he used the record store phone that day? I Well, there's different explanations. One, that he was cheating on his wife, had a mistress, uh, was using that phone. I mean, people uh, who are cops who sit in cars have specific landlines that they use, the same landline normally. Sometimes it's a coffee shop, a restaurant, but this guy used the record store. Not that it matters. I mean, um, but no, I don't know. I don't know. There's different speculation as to what he was doing. I know his wife made a fortune off his death. Um, not unlike uh, Marina Oswald, people mailed her checks from all over the world. She made a fortune, um, millions uh, in money, as you know, in a lot of ways. So did uh, Marina Oswald. Oh, I'm... I mean, there was no GoFundMe back then. You simply mailed cash to. <laughs> to whoever you felt deserved it back in those days. Interesting. Uh, <clears throat> Basil Beshkov wants to know, Johnson's wife looked looks extremely serene during the swearing, swearing in on the plane. Was she aware of the plot? I doubt it. I mean, she was she, she was so compartmentalized uh, in her life with him. Uh, she didn't know anything. You know, I know that he asked her to lay out a different dress so when Jackie comes on the plane, I don't know how we got onto this plane stuff, but when Jackie comes on the, uh, when LBJ comes on the plane, uh, he goes into uh, RFK's presidential uh, bedroom and he takes his shirt off, gets on his, uh, gets on the phone to his uh, stockbroker and he begins telling him to sell, 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 that the market's going to collapse. This is the first thing he does. I, I mean, of course. Um, the market's going to collapse because of the death of the United States president. So he gets on the phone and calls his broker uh, and tells him to sell all his stock. And uh, as he's laying in bed, in JFK's bed, scratching his belly with no shirt on, the door opens up and it's the blood-soaked Jackie Kennedy. And uh, he jumps up and he puts on a shirt and he apologizes and she's like horrified to see him in there. But later on, when they leave, uh, him and his wife, uh, he asks uh, Lady Bird to pick out a dress for her, she, he, out of her own dresses, out of Jackie's dresses. And she takes out a uh, clean dress, puts it on the bed, and tells her they're gonna be, there's going to be a swearing in. And uh, LBJ would like her to attend the swearing in. And that's where she famously says, I'm going to continue to the, wear the dress that I have. I want them to see what they did to my husband. And that's the blood-soaked dress that she wears during the swearing-in. But to answer the question, Lady Bird attempted to get her at LBJ's urging to switch into a clean, pristine dress. And she refused and made that statement. All right. Um, if that helps anybody. Sure. David Snyder, if you could go back to that day and be in Dealey Plaza and pick one vantage point, what area would that be? Well, I mean, I think that rooftop where Weatherford is, you know what I mean, where the sheriff is, um, is quite a vantage point um, to see everything, like a bird's eye view. It's the highest. You could see across to the Texas School Book Depository. You could see, I believe, the trestle, um, the overpass trestle on the, on the left. Uh, that would be an incredible vantage point. But there were people in the government building uh, that's right there watching the assassination unfold from their windows, from their office windows, Eric, you know, the trestle might not be a bad spot either. I know. To I know. Well, there, there were people of... there on the trestle who were rail railroad workers who were allowed to be up there for reasons that nobody knows. I don't know why they let them be up there. I mean, it didn't make any sense. You know, they were right in the middle of the overpass for Christ's sakes. Hmm. Uh, Gary Shaw, AIVW88 says head doctored in Z, Z films. Gary Shaw, show? I think, um, was the head of the school book depository museum. Um, if I'm remembering this correctly, oh, and I think he might have switched sides near the end of his life. Yeah, I heard that about the museum. <laughs> uh, do you believe the story of Oswald palm print being taken at the funeral home before burial? 
Yeah, I mean, it's pretty well documented. The guy, I mean, he didn't have a dog in the hunt, the mortuary attendant. He just said the two, FB, the two uh, uh, Dallas police came in, detectives, uh, and asked him to leave. They went in there with the body, and, and, and they had the gun. You know, they brought a gun with them to a funeral home. That's odd. And, um, and then he claimed that he had to wipe the ink off of Oswald's dead fingers. I mean, that's some cock and bull story for somebody to make up when, when people are getting whacked for even looking the wrong way in the Kennedy assassination. Why would a guy, a mortuary attendant who never wrote a book, never made money off it, why would he come up with this completely insane cock and bull story and put his life on the line claiming what I just said was true. It makes absolutely no sense unless it's true. I mean, it, it's just, he would just be a lunatic, you know, to make this thing up. And, and you know, he, I think he had enough prominence in Dallas to not be killed, you know, as a, as a funeral uh, home attendant. It would have just been too obvious because he was the guy that did the embalming uh, of Oswald and, you know, legitimate funeral home. But yeah, I believe it. Yeah, I, I think they also the FBI turned back the rifle, said there was no prints anywhere. You know, I mean, you could say that the FBI was incompetent, but the rifle was flown in a jet fighter plane to uh, to uh, Quantico and then brought back in a jet fighter plane and given back to Dallas. And they said there's no prints on it. So, so what do they do? They go over to the body and they put the palm print on there, on the stock uh, of the of the rifle. I mean, it it sounds brazen, it sounds crass, but when you're framing, you have to do these framing things. I mean, Eric and I discussed how they create the sniper's nest out of multiple boxes and how they took photos of different configurations of the goddamn boxes in the sniper's nest. I mean, you can't make this up. You know, I mean, look at the photos. What I like, though, is if you're there visiting, the box configuration doesn't match the photo. <laughs> so well, yeah, those, those side are different. By side, you're like, yeah. wait, wait, wait a minute here. Um, Ray wants to say, wow, guys, thanks for answering my question. I'm honored. Legends. Which uh, what question was his? I forget. I don't know, but you're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, Al Gonzalez. Uh, met Jim Laville. Laville? Years Lavelle, ago, Lavelle. Uh, Lavelle. Uh, met Jim Lavelle years ago, and he told me they didn't have enough evidence to convict Oswald of anything. Yeah, I mean, Nicholas Katzenbach said that, the Deputy Attorney General, Jay Hoover said that to uh, LBJ. I mean, it, it's just, uh, it wasn't enough to to um, convict. I mean, it's just a simple case. I mean, you wonder why, if he's trying to kill a police officer in the Texas theater, that they didn't charge him with attempted murder of that Dallas police officer who claimed to stick his finger between the broken firing pin of his revolver and, and, and the gun. I mean, why didn't they do that? Because it didn't happen, you know, and there were plenty of people in that, in that theater. So the reality of it is they didn't even charge him with the murder of the, of, uh, of or attempted murder of that cop in the, in the Texas theater. Uh, they needed the tip at murder to make sure that they had something where they could, uh, put him on trial for at least the murder of Tippett, which is the, why the Tippett thing is so important as a frame job. Because if you can't go to trial with him, which Lavelle is correct, if you can't go to trial with the evidence of that you have uh, in the murder of the president, at least you have the killing of a cop. Okay, in my enough. humble opinion, anyway. Um, this is kind of a weird one on the line. Um, if Oswald was a patsy and he saw Tippett pulled up outside of this precinct, he may have pulled his gun first, knowing what was going to happen. Except we don't think he could. Well, could have it's not a there precinct; and... it's his car. First of all, in 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 Oak Cliff, I, I don't know about the precinct, but he may have pulled his gun first. Um, but he 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 couldn't do the shooting because he couldn't make it there into the theater in time to do the shooting. So again, people, it's so funny, like, you know, people frame these, not this guy, but a lot of people frame the question, like if Oswald's in this, in the sniper's nest, can he get off three shots? Well, he's not in the sniper's nest, bro. So how does he get off the three shots? They, they allow these questions to have the presumption of phony facts to lead to the question. You know, if, if he's shooting Tippett, you know, maybe he, you know, doesn't get off four shots, you know, that kind of thing. But, I mean, so many people are trying to walk it off. I mean, they, these timelines 
are hard to beat because uh, Butch, the manager of the Texas Theater, said Oswald made it in time for the um, the uh, uh, coming attractions and bought popcorn from him before the movie even started. What the Warren Commission attempted to do was say that Oswald came in, the movie was going on for an hour before he gets in there. Uh, not true. And uh, Butch was suppressed, you know, by the FBI, told him to shut his trap, but he did give interviews uh, to local authorities. This is the manager of the Texas Theater, by the way, um, who uh, said that Oswald was there even way before the movie started, saw the coming attractions. All right. Um, Big Bill 767 on locals. Oh, actually, on locals. Whoa, it's Dustin said, had to bust up an HOA Baltacular committee meeting. So. I could access a conference room to listen to the show. Thank you, Dustin. Weird. Oh, way to go. Man with a man with a goal. Yeah, absolutely. Bill, okay, Big Bill 767 wants to know question. How many shooting locations do you think were used? I count at least six. Book depository, um, two, railroad overpass, Daltex, Grassy Knoll, and Records Building firing seven to twelve bullets. That sounds like five. Right. Well, it's saying two at the uh, book depository, so could be six. Then. Yeah, five or six. Yeah, yeah. hard to. Yeah, five or six. Look, he wasn't. <laughs> they they were they were loaded for bear. I mean that that thing was uh, you know mapped out pretty pretty thoroughly. What's it? Roger Stone said turkey shoot. It's a turkey shoot. Well, he didn't say it. I mean, it's also oh. by and Jim Garrison says it in uh, JFK. It? Okay. Um. Pat M, your best guess, count of government ops who knew the JFK assassination before the event. Did the shots go off as pre-planned? And was it known before which shooter would be the successful gunman in the fatal shot? Probably not. I, again, I don't understand what successful gunman is when you've got six or seven guys. It's not an award show, bro. It's not like there there there's a successful gunman. I mean, I, I think that they put... People who had different skills at different locations. I mean, they, when you stand behind that picket fence, you know, at the uh, uh, grassy knoll, it is such a short shot, right, Eric? Mm -hmm. You know, that you it's just insanely short. Uh, so maybe whoever that guy is has that skill to do that short shot to the head. The guy who's over on the uh, overpass has a different skill. You know, as... Um, as Garrison says, you know, it's one thing to uh, kill a man with a rifle, but it's 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 more, very difficult with a scope. And you have to be trained with a scope to use a scope. So, again, you know, I don't even think the guy who is on the grassy knoll is using a scope uh, because it's such a chip shot. So, no. uh, right, Eric? Probably not. I, right. I, I think it would almost interfere. Yeah, um, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Honestly, I think it was a matter of you have a mission – they don't care who gets it. Everybody's yeah, trying I know. to it, 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 it's, all, like, it's all simultaneous. This whole thing of like, who went first? Who went second? They, they, dude, they're just going at the same exact time. I mean, it, it's so crazy. Who cares? Like, I don't even know why that's an issue. Yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure on the full details. Um, Dino, do you think incoming presidents are subtly or outright briefed on how things will be? Are they told to play ball? And I'm guessing MIC, military industrial complex, and the permanent class. I'm sure people talk to people when they come into office. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, they get the presidential daily brief and they just go, holy crap, who knew this stuff? You know what I mean? I mean, well, everyone I think he was talking about. about uh, what's that? I, I think he was talking about are they threatened? Like the second they go in, it's like, okay, Mr. President, congratulations. I, I this is how it's going to be. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, can you explain the homosexual cabal? Strange coincidence or something nefarious? No, it's, I mean, it's it, it's part of the intelligence. The Russians had it too. You had to be bisexual just to operate in that world. You know, whether it's a homosexual cabal, I don't think it is. I think that most intelligence operatives by design, by design, by the nature of the beast, have to be bisexual or at least operate in sexual areas that um, may be more beneficial to go both ways just for the job. I mean, I think Ruth Payne did that. I think uh, uh, Marina Oswald did that. I think even there's stuff that Oswald did, um, apparently with uh, a Russian colonel in Minsk uh, or in Moscow that um, was filmed. Uh, so yeah, I think it's part of the job. 
I don't think it's anything to do with gay rights or gay world. No, it's not. But I, I'm going to go a little different on it because when you're getting a clearance, especially back in the day when I was in the army, that was one of the big questions. People who led an alternate lifestyle were vulnerable to blackmail and were easier to control from intelligence agencies and things like that. So, and no, I agree. Better than, just, but I'm better than a drug about... addict who would be completely unreliable. You know, right. I'm just talking about intelligence operatives themselves. I'm not talking about you're correct about your thing. I'm talking about intelligence operatives had to be able to do this. They had right. to be able to go and and go undercover and do things that most normal uh, people would not be able to do, I think. But yeah, I think I think it was a threat that you could be compromised. But I think the reverse is true for intelligence operatives, that they had to be able to do it to, to do their job, Eric. Right. Right. Um, CI Crown Jewels, what revelation is number one? Uh, probably the assassination of various uh, world leaders, you know what I mean, that, that, that we don't know about. All right. Um, glass spray from window shot painted out? Glass spray from window shot painted out. I mean, these are like haikus. <laughs> these, this this well, one's yeah. a haiku. I, I can only suggest that... Um, He's referring to the window shot of the windshield of the limousine or, you know, I don't know. It was beveled inward mm -hmm. that it was shot from the outside uh, front of the um, windshield. The beveling was on the inside um, and um, the windshield was replaced. And we deal with that in other episodes uh, immediately flown to uh, Dearborn via Cincinnati or some convoluted route where it was ground up into glass and then rebuilt and replaced the windshield. Uh, I don't know why you'd have to replace a windshield of a windshield that didn't have a bullet hole in it, Eric. Hmm. All right, good point. Um, thank you for all you guys do. One day we'll all know the truth, though I believe there's a rather large percent of, percentage of Americans who still wouldn't accept it. The world view would shatter. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It's so funny because uh, they accept us killing world leaders and toppling governments around the world, but they can't accept anything happening here. To me, that's some Disney view of the world that's just through rose-colored glasses. And I think those glasses have been, been removed in the past four years for most people, except, um, I believe, like uh, the Rachel Maddow crowd, the MK Ultra 2.0 crowd that believes... Um, or was brainwashed into believing much of the stuff that's come out in the past four years. Uh, Mark, do you remember during the Democratic 1968 convention when um, Vidal called Buckley a yeah, yeah it's cryptic a... Nazi and he called Vidal a queer? Yeah, I mean, I think it's in a documentary about their relationship um, between the two of them. There's a movie about that. I forgot the title of it. Yeah, you know, uh, a series of debates that they went back and forth. Back yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it was his show. I mean, it was Firing Line. Best of uh, Enemies? Best of Friends? No, Best of Enemies. I think. Best of Enemies or something, yeah, because they were regulars on the same show. I mean, um, Gore Vidal, famously, as we discussed in the Arthur Bremer episode, felt that he, Bremer did not write those, uh, the diary that someone else had written it, that it was written by a professional uh, novelist. Uh, and he believes it was E. Howard Hunt. Uh, Gore Vidal does. It is Best of Enemies. Okay. okay cool. it's a, which is a great doc, by the way. Um, Shaw, 78, front shooter on White Wall Verified. Shaw, 78, <laughs> front shooter on White Wall Verified. I, I don't know what that means. I mean, I believe the front shooter was where Eric and I stood on the trestle. Uh, all the way to the far end of the trestle. You can basically see the shot in your eye, uh, how clean it is from that trestle to the throat uh, in the limo. I, I don't think about the pergola he might have been referring to, the white pergola on the um, in front of the grassy knoll. I don't think that's a spot at all. I believe there's the fence and then the far end of the uh, trestle uh, for the throat shot because um, nothing, there's no place the throat shot can come from you know, other than that trestle. I mean, uh, and there's nothing in back of it. You know, there's just the train yards in back of it. All right. Well, we've got 635 people watching us on Rumble right now. Maybe. Go Rumble. Are there any Rumble questions or are you taking... Yeah, I'm going to it right now. Okay. Um, 
R G R R P H, do you agree that the angle required for a shot to hit the right temple of JFK and then blow out the back of his head does not match up with where Badge Man is in the Mary Mormon picture? Again, it's a chip shot from 10 feet away. I don't know about Badge Man, bro, but whoever was standing there, it's a chip shot. Eric and I stood there. It's so easy to make that shot. It's to the right temple, blows out the back of his head. It's, it's not even debatable anymore. You know, that, that you, you have 28 Parkland doctors talking about the back uh, skull blown out, you know, six to eight inches of skull blown out. All right, uh, Boya. Beautiful explanation of the quid pro quo with services rendered by LBJ. Was he a stooge whose drunken desires were directed to physical reality by the deep state, his culpability, their insurance? No, I, I think he was a megalomaniac, and I think he was also someone who wanted to save his own ass. I mean, it was double barrel action for, for Johnson. He also had a heart condition. He realized he couldn't survive much, much longer. He does die almost to the exact date that he would have left office from his second term that he bailed out on uh, of office. Uh, he died literally um, a few days after his term would have ended. Um, so he was popping nitroglycerin pills uh, all day and night uh, to keep the heart going. And he, the alcoholism had progressed and blah, blah, blah. You know, when he bails out in 68 in March. Uh, but no, I, I think he it was double edged because he, he cannot go down uh, politically a notch. He can only go up a notch to survive. And the, he couldn't go back to being the Speaker of the Senate and survive this scandal. He had to go upward to put the, out the fire. So he, it's it's really this confluence of events that leads him to uh, do what he does and uh, need to do what he does. Uh, so it's motivation, it's means, opportunity, and and method. Uh, he's got all of them. I mean, he really does. I mean, anyone who wants to analyze this case should analyze it like just a regular murder of means, opportunity, and method, and it, all roads will point to to Lyndon Johnson. Yep, even Oliver Stones. Um, <laughs> Gumbasto on Rumble. I read that a made guy was seen by Tippett and he was not supposed to be in Dallas. So is that a possible scenario? I mean, I, I don't know. Johnny Roselli was not there. I don't know who the made guy was. Obviously, the um, uh, Campisi brothers were involved in, uh, you know, the shuffling or the handling off of the money to Jack Ruby to uh, uh, eradicate uh, Oswald uh, because that $50,000 goes into a safe. The safe is put into the office uh, the carousel club upstairs and it is uh, drilled into the floor uh, he signs over the power of attorney tells his attorney to use the money to pay his tax debt uh, which is substantial about fifty thousand uh, dollars he's seen with money stuffed in his uh, suit jacket at the bank um, and i think the money was not the campisi's money it wasn't their personal money the campisi's funneled uh, the money from uh, the deep state to Ruby to, to do their bidding. I don't think uh, uh, Gambino woke up one day and said, let's give Ruby $50,000 to execute Ros Oswald two seconds after the assassination. I mean, it happens the same weekend, for Christ's sakes. You know what I mean? You think the mob is like just going to take $50,000, the equivalent of $350,000, and, and just give it to this guy to kill Oswald? Why? What's it to them? What's it to them? If the mob killed Kennedy... What is Oswald going to say? The mob killed Kennedy? I, I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense. What makes sense is they were used as a conduit. They were used as a conduit to execute Ruby and, and uh, to execute Oswald and Ruby knew the terrain. And, was, and believe me, he tries on Friday. He tries on Saturday. He's scared shitless Ruby. He's addicted to Dexedrine. He's a homosexual. He's taking um, syphilis medication. Um, he has um, an older ma gay male who lives with him, George Senator, in his apartment uh, near the uh, execution site of Tippett. Um, he is a guy involved in a lot of stuff. And uh, he wants the chicken out in the worst way, but he realizes that he's got till Sunday to get this done uh, because he's already taken the money and, and put it in the safe. So um, he's in a tough spot. 
He really is in a tough spot. Okay. <laughs> Let's, all right, Hunley. <laughs> all right, Glowy here. Love your show. Sometimes I get notes from Thanks. Hunley in the private chat. That <laughs> I don't do anything. I just don't answer the questions, but Hunley sends me these nutty notes. Go ahead, bro. I'm sorry. Um, any word on how Ethel Kennedy is doing or if she has spoken about RFK Jr. running? I think she's basically a vegetable. Um, they wheeled her in, I think it was to uh, um, the Kennedy case of uh, the one who was married to Andrew Cuomo um, for driving under the influence of Ambien um, back in the day in Connecticut. And that was like 10, that was 10 years ago. They wheeled her in then to testify for her daughter. But no, I haven't heard anything. In fact, um, I was privy to internal emails that I still have of RFK Jr. emailing his sister for using his mother, who he claims was a vegetable. Uh, this was three years ago or two years ago um, to undermine him and the Sirhan case when both of us were at the parole hearing. Um, I was privy to these emails through Paul Schrade, the late Paul Schrade, who was shot during the assassination uh, by Sirhan in the, in the front of the head. Um, the emails were of RFK to his sister, um, uh, denouncing her and having complete shock and, and anger about her using the mom as a prop. Let me just paraphrase it. Right. Um, I have no idea the relation here, but Walter Cronkite for $2. Thank you. <laughs> That's the way it is. November 22nd, 1963. A German Mauser is found at the Texas School Book Depository. Yes, a Mauser. And the assassin sniper ate lunch while he waited for the president. All right. Um, Rick Time, I think his fingerprints were planted to muddy the water that Mac Wallace. Why? I, don't, I don't think you have to muddy the water anymore. I mean, finding Mac Wallace's fingerprints. Um, and why would you plant his? Right. It doesn't help anybody. I mean, all it does is finger LBJ. If you want to finger anybody, put his main protege, uh, uh, one of his protege's fingerprints on the on the uh, boxes at the sniper's nest. That's going to get muddy. All right. At the next files release, docs will show CIA did have connections with LHO. But they did not disclose because egg on their faces, not collusion. Thoughts? Could be. I mean, as I've said before, I don't, again, people keep saying the CIA, but it's really O&I people. It's the Office of Naval Intelligence that Oswald worked for. And as a Marine, uh, that's uh, the O&I uh, group that he reported to. CIA, obviously they overlap, you know, with different intelligence groups, but I believe he was, the operation in Minsk was O&I that Oswald represented. The CIA had side files on every uh, phony defector, of course, but I think um, there might be, uh, and again, famously, ONI came into the um, House Assassinations Committee hearings, uh, grinning from ear to ear, and they said, we destroyed all our files, go F yourselves. So look at ONI people instead of CIA once in a while. All right. Um Old men in chairs. Why do you think they got cold feet as far as tying the assassination to Castro and going after him? Uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. Oh, about uh, JFK? Yeah. Yeah, I think it was um, LBJ. He just put the kibosh on it. They came to him right after the assassination, and he said, no, nah, I'm, I'm in power now. I don't need that anymore. And, and basically, that's what happened. I don't need it. Okay, well, I wrap think it he... up. Wrap it up. Let's move on. Is yeah, no, I think, I, I think he screwed them on that. I really do. I think he gave them the war. But I think he screwed them on the invasion and the toppling of Castro. And I think the deal with the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, held that no president would ever invade the island in the deal with the uh, Soviets uh, to remove the missiles. Uh, that was a deal upheld by every administration that there would be no invasion. And Operation Mongoose was canceled. Uh, Bill Harvey was put out to pasture in Rome. He was a total alcoholic, the one who was running Mongoose. Uh, some debate, RFK Jr. says his father was not overseeing Operation Mongoose. I find that hard to believe, um, but he, that's his claim. Um, Harvey was physically on the ground running it, and it was the plug was pulled after, after the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. So I think uh, Johnson didn't need the aggravation. He already had power. Why uh, make things worse for himself and have an invasion all of a sudden? 
All right. Um, thoughts on Russ Baker's book, Family of Secrets? Lots of holes, lots of trouble, lots of mistakes, lots of crazy crap. If a RFK is elected, do you believe he would go scorched earth on the FBI and CIA? Hmm. It's interesting. I don't know what scorched earth means, but I think he would be the first guy to really um, go full church committee on them. Definitely. And uh, somebody else pointed this out earlier. Could be wrong, but I don't think you actually said happy birthday to that kid. Somebody <laughs> pointed out that it might be one of those like um, Michael Hunt jokes or whatever. You know, if you know. take the the names. so Who's got time for that, honey? I'm uh, trying to help the poor kid. The kid's in a wheelchair. He's got no legs. I mean, for the love of God, I'm just trying to cheer him up. You know, have some decency. <laughs> Come on, people. Not sure. You changed my opinion about JFK history. Love your videos. I shoot many different sniper rifles. Can you expand on the hot barrel story? My experience is a barrel doesn't get warm to the touch until three to four shots. Thanks. Just telling you what a deputy sheriff said when he was up there with Weatherford and he grabbed the barrel of the rifle and it was hot. I mean, I'm just repeating what the other deputy sheriff, a uh, new kid on the block, said when he uh didn't grab it. He he grabbed the barrel of the rifle, trying to help Weatherford come down from the roof, and he said that it was hot or warm. I don't know the temperature of it, but that that was the testimony uh, of a fellow deputy sheriff. So that's right. And if it was laying in the sun on a roof too, then that would be a factor. So Could be. it's November twenty second. November twenty second in Dallas is not that hot, but no. okay. Um. Ronald Pinta, fifty dollars. Hello. Is that a picture of Pinta there? Is that him I on a so. Harley or something? What's yep. Who, okay. Pinta is also Gumbasto, but we're not sure if he's a wolfer. Right. But very, very generous. Mo Bishop, how in the world did the police know to go to the theater? They said it was from the the, the shoe salesman, uh, John Johnny. What's his name? Um, but the reality of it was, I mean, they were there with the entire. <laughs> Not only were there 800 police cars there, every news crew was there within moments to show up at that theater. So he must have really offended the shoe, st the shoe store manager to uh, have him call in that 911. Um, is it true that JFK couldn't duck down after the first hit because he was wearing a back brace? No. Back, the, back, the back brace was very low on the back, and uh, some people have used that as some excuse to uh, say the the bullet was deflected by the back brace is just not true. But even um, his medical doctor um, said that was not true. Um, are you guys going to do an episode on Alan Dulles? Yeah. That's just that's a that's a monster one. It's kind of like Curtis LeMay. It takes a long time to get those big ones out, right? Mark, what? I said, yeah. Uh, uh, I said, no, I said, uh, is that correct? That Dulles is like a major episode. It takes a while to put it together. Kind of like Curtis LeMay took a while to put together. There's a lot to him. That is true. Um, Cafe Guitarist. No, no, no. The Z film and others should have glass spray. Gary okay. Shaw was not museum guy. The... Alt V W T V eighty eight. I don't know who that is. is that a YouTube channel? I, I don't know what that is. I don't know. I'm, I'm not interested in alterations of the Sapruta film. Thanks for stopping by. Glad the CIA is still working. I mean, they're very busy and uh, obviously watch the channel. <laughs> Chris Patton, has your opinion of JFK changed from your research? Yeah, I mean, I didn't really know that much about his internal politics, and you know, the, it it always changes because of the um, the knowledge that I get. You know, reading more and more about it. I mean, I didn't know we did acid and weed with you know Mary. I mean, <laughs> there's different things. You know. All right, um, Al Parks on uh, locals wants to know was the uh trademark the backup venue for a hit watch the vid the function waiting for jfk arrival and they had a big special chair for jfk good for rehearsal i suppose uh yeah i mean i, I as i mentioned before i i fought to the death to get the uh 
the trademark as the as the destination there was a reason for that and i believe that was a backup site to uh, the daily plaza site if that didn't occur i think they were going to get them at the trademark um read uh, bruno's book uh, advanced man and he will discuss um in detail his war with uh, Connolly over the trademark versus the women's building uh, at the fair fairgrounds. Uh, it doesn't make any sense other than something was going to happen there. And, and I and, and to, to answer that further, I believe that Connolly believed that the event was going to happen at the trademark, and that's why he got into that car. I don't think that uh, Connolly knew that that was going to happen there himself. All right, on Rumble, we have a rant from a Wolfer saying a Wolfer is not Gumbasto, but I support his spirit. Okay. And thank you, Wolfer, for a $50 Rumble rant. Uh, Bighorn Shaver on Locals. Uh, question, recently watched the body language panel, that's the behavior panel, analysis of Oswald. They pretty much said he lied with everything he said. They also went really hard on his previous history and then he went to Mexico City. Do they watch this channel? I, I don't Occasionally, know. Occasionally they might. Um, I don't know. We, we've never discussed the case with my friends over there, so I don't know. Um, Guilty as Jumbo said a tip. The hole blown out was the same size Walter Sheridan put in to leaking Garrison's case. Whose side was Bill Boxley C. Wood on? What was that? Um, the the hole blown out was the same size Walter Sheridan put into leaking Garrison's case. Whose side was Bill Boxley, in quotes, and then lowercase c, and then Wood? All right, do, 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 do. Please, please, please. Just move on. Just move on. <laughs> yeah. We have a lot of people. If you're not going to write fucking English, bro, we can't decipher your hieroglyphics. I'm least busy here. Come on. Come on, just write a fucking question for Christ's sakes. Um, lost track of the timeline for my question. Don't muss my hair like yours, Mark. <laughs> okay. Um, Mike Smith saying, Mark, go buy another book. Love your channel, guys. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Gray Ghost. Mark, do you believe the plot began with LBJ and his people or the deep state? And what put and at what point during JFK's term? Was it decided he needed to be removed? I think after the Cuban Missile Crisis, and I, and and JFK talks about that. He talks about uh, seven days in May, the book by Fletcher Neville, that he could be assassinated, that there could be a military coup because of any further events like the Cuban Missile Crisis or the Bay of Pigs. He is sensing it. He talks about going into nut country. He talks about the fact that a third event would lead to a coup d'état. I mean, he himself is saying this. Let alone them. Uh, I believe the Bay of Pigs, when LeMay says, you know, when they have, a, they come back for their anniversary a month later uh, to discuss the Bay of Pigs success, uh, LeMay famously says, we lost, we should have gone in there and we still should do it right now. Um, I think the Bay of Pigs event uh, sealed his fate. You know, everybody talks about the Cuban, uh, the, the, you know, the Soviet missile treaty which adds to it obviously the speech the pax americana speech uh but it i i believe it's the war with the joint chiefs and the cuban missile crisis that really scares them and i i, I think they were legitimately scared of jfk i think they thought this guy was going to get us killed you know and 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 all sides said we got lucky in the bay of pigs all right um question on locals what happened to the rifle that weatherford found Whoa, 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 I don't know about Weatherford's rifle that he found. I mean, you've got the Mauser. You've got Weatherford's own rifle. Um, the Carcano is one that's planted in there that they bring out that doesn't even match the one that supposedly Oswald had and left in New Orleans that was in the uh, house that he rented there. I mean, he comes back from New Orleans empty-handed. Um, so I don't know which rifle that they're referring to in the question. The rifle that Weatherford had was his own. Uh, with the sniper rifle, the, the, whatever the rifle was, I'm not really sure, but that was Weatherford's own assignment, uh, supposedly according to Weatherford, that he was assigned the rooftop with his sniper rifle. 
Okay. I say sniper rifle generically. I'm not really sure what he had up there. All right. Um, shit, this went by. Mark, have you ever eaten a bone-in chicken sandwich with a Dr. Pepper? Okay, so <laughs> obviously refer referring to Bonnie Ray Williams, yes. the uh, black uh, employee at the Texas School Book Depository, who leads the Warren Commission uh, page after page after page down some rabbit hole asking him questions about his chicken sandwich. Uh, and the Warren Commissioners were very fascinated about the fact that the chicken had no bone and that he had the Dr. Pepper, which is cited by Walter Cronkite earlier, my impression of Walter Cronkite, which somehow bleeds into my impression of Richard Nixon, but uh, don't be confused. The, the Bonnie Ray Williams chicken sandwich uh, had a bone in it. Um, I guess that's a thing. And he tried to explain this to the Warren Commission. Um, that being said, the chicken bones were on the floor and there was a, a cigarette pack and also the empty bottle of Dr. Pepper uh, that is taken out by Dallas police. You can see that on a stick when it's brought down uh, from the sixth floor. There's a photo of the soda bottle. That was all by Bonnie Ray Williams. And Bonnie Ray Williams was up there until... <laughs> until 1230 or maybe even later for all we know, but they tried to walk him back from the timeline and they just kept browbeating him. Could you have left at 1225, maybe 1220, maybe 1205, you know, to go downstairs and get him out of the sniper's nest. It was a big deal to the Warren Commission. It was a huge deal to get him out of that phony sniper's nest. And the sniper's nest is not a sniper's nest at all. It's Bonnie Ray Williams throwing some boxes together to eat lunch on the boxes while watching the presidential motorcade. That's what the sniper's nest is. Anybody who tells you anything different, it's the future construction by Dallas police into a sniper's looking nest with those same boxes. Bonnie Ray Williams assembled those boxes so he could eat lunch in that sniper's nest uh, to watch the motorcade. That's what the assemblage of boxes is. At the same time that um, Oswald is in the second floor lunchroom, having come up from the first floor lunchroom, which is the domino room uh, where people of color ate lunch and Oswald ate with them uh, some sort of a social protest on a regular basis on the first floor. The second floor lunchroom was pristine, had the Coke machines and everything. And that's where he was going from the first to the second to get a Coke. And we know that because one of the secretaries uh, broke a dollar bill for him to put change in the Coke machine. Uh, but that being said, Bonnie Ray Williams and the chicken sandwich were um, up on the sixth floor window. All right. Uh, Lindsay Manns, keep up the wonderful work, gentlemen. Thank you. Happy guitarist again. So the brains blow out the back of the head and the frames are not painted in. You're kidding. Oh, bro. You, you, you're in the wrong channel, bro. You're in the wrong channel. We're way past this crap. Way past that, bro. You're on the wrong channel. All right, Chris Patton. Do you agree more with JFK's handling of foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis Cuba, Vietnam, and the Cold War, or do you agree with his deep state adversaries? I agree with him on Vietnam. I disagree with him on Cuba. And I, I the Cold War is just too vague to agree or disagree. Uh, so it's, it's not black and white, people. It's not black and white. This is a gray world. You really got to get that through your heads. If you watch this channel, we're not a black and white channel. I know that's hard for people to think who have black and white thinking, but that's not what we're about, not what I'm about, because I've seen both sides as journalists. I try not to do what this guy is saying. You know, which side are you on of every freaking item that there ever is? It's gray. It's gray. Okay. There's different elements to different things. I mean, look at the interview with JFK and Walter Cronkite, the last interview he gave. In the same interview, he says, it's, it, we're, I'm going to end this war and take out the, the, the advisors. And then in the second part of the interview, he says it's up to the Vietnamese to win this thing. And he contradicts himself in the same interview. Yeah. Um, last super chat. Last question. Mark, will you keep all these books to create a real American history library? Uh, I'm discussing it now with various people. Good idea. Yeah, you, know, you definitely uh, want to have things willed or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not going to let it just disappear. And and that is important. We, when we were at the conference last year, they were talking about a gentleman who, um, 
sadly had Alzheimer's and had to let his collection go. And they were mm. trying to get with other people, figure out how to preserve this. I guess he had thousands of books. And mm -hmm. that's, a, that's always a concern, having legacy, things like that. But on that note, we have our Patsy right here. Oh, my. To take us out. Our actual okay. Oswald is still on the run. I'm hoping that folks may want to check out and see us at the meetup if you're in that part of the country. Or tickets are still available for the meetup. The VIP has been sold out, but there are tickets available for the main meetup on Sunday of Labor Day weekend. Mm -hmm. And you can find them all at erichumley.eventbrite.com. What do you get yeah. with that ticket, homie? Do you get... Um... Uh, you get a, a wonderful experience being part of a live show. No, I mean, you get food some, and the, the stuff yeah. you get with it. I mean, you get yeah, some, some stuff. food, um, entertainment. some drinks, you'll get, you get some entertainment. But um, okay, so what about subscribing? Can they subscribe to the channel or? Uh, I, I believe it's still allowed that um, yeah, they can subscribe or follow if they're on Rumble because there are people who pointed out that, hey, we don't watch YouTube, we watch Rumble. Love having you there too. Some people just Please listen to it. I mean, I guess if you don't have any graphics uh, like today, I mean, you can listen to it um, and mow the yeah. lawn or something, you know. Yeah, and even with sometimes people listen and if they want to look, then they, they'll see it. And of course, um, encourage everybody to follow us on Locals, on structure.locals.com. It's free to follow us. You don't have to pay. If you are a supporter though, and let's say you're going to the meetup, healthy discount for the meetup. We're also oh, putting right. things there for- It's like a know, 30 discount or something. It's quite a bit. Yeah. It's quite a bit. It's $25 off actually. Oh, so, wow. good. That's good. Um, very, very sizable. You can always- you know, you, uh, Go ahead, I'm sorry. I was gonna say, you can always support uh, Mark with his PayPal uh, below. I'm also on PayPal or Venmo or Cash App. Yeah, if you uh, wanna get me more books that I can barely get to. You could go to the PayPal or Venmo uh, JFK Book Fund and uh, contribute to even additional books. I'm working on, for Tuesday, um, The Brother of the Rosenbergs, uh, which is a, a, a story that is untold. Um, the brother is David Greenglass, and we're going to get into that on Tuesday, and that takes some rare books. Um, so if you want to donate money towards the book fund, that's where it goes. You know, it goes towards those types of books, and the book's... And I think I may have tracked down Arthur Bremer's diary in Birmingham, Alabama, at a University of Alabama. I've got some uh, librarian working on it for me uh, to try to dig out part one of the Arthur Bremer diary. Everybody's got part two, but part one seems to have been donated to, in my quest, I've now found that it's been donated to the Birmingham branch of the University of Alabama. So I'm trying to, I have to go in with a group of Watergate burglars in the middle of the night, a plumber's unit to get it. But uh, I'm going to try to go through legal means at first to get to the diary. And if we do get it, we'll put it on locals, right, Eric? Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. And I can't believe we've actually been demonetized on this one. What did we, Well, it's a lot of assassination stuff, so. <laughs> I don't know, but I, I request a review on that one. Technical foul, number 23, Eric Hunley. Requesting review out of New York. Definitely. Definitely. Thanks, James Allen. Um, no, I mean, the stupid chats help. We, we've been demonetized four shows in a row. Everybody thinks yeah. this is a grifter's paradise. Uh, we get demonetized every other show. Yeah, it's it's getting it's it's getting very frustrating. Yeah. Extremely frustrating. But we do appreciate it. And we will be back for Reform Friday. Oh, yeah. I forgot on Friday. Yeah. Then we can uh, get demonetized again. Or not. Or not. <laughs> we're, we're, we're working on. We're working on it. Okay. But everybody, thank you so much, and we'll see you then. Okay. Mm -hmm.